microphone working? Yes. All right, thank you, Helen. I live in Page, which uh, is right in between the two locations on planet Earth that I like the most. Uh, Lake Powell, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, and Grand Canyon. Uh, these two parks are very different, though. In one case, in the case of Grand Canyon, we tried to leave it alone, leave it the way it uh, was given to us. And in the case of Glen Canyon, the story's been a little different. We uh, dammed it up uh, with a big concrete dam and have uh, uh, changed it into a recreation area. And I first learned about Lake Powell uh, back when I was a kid living in Missouri. I remember seeing an article about um, Lake Powell and Glen Canyon, the new lake in National Geographic. And then shortly after that, uh, being somewhat involved in the Sierra Club, I learned that this was a terrible thing, uh, what had happened to Glen Canyon. And it was clear to me that it was a terrible thing, the loss of a beautiful canyon that was just as deserving of uh, protection as Grand Canyon. But I ended up moving to Page, and that complicated things. At first, uh, I used the lake as access to the backcountry. And if you've ever been to Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, you've probably been there by way of the lake. But 87% of the recreation area is actually dry land, and most of that is wilderness. So it's really a pretty amazing area, and it is, uh, uh, sits right next to the Navajo Reservation, and the northern edge of the reservation in that area is also a magnificent area. So I have, uh, please don't tell anyone outside this room, <laughs> I have come to like Lake Powell. <laughs> it's kind of an embarrassment, but it's a magnificent place. So I really divide my time between two very different parks, Grand Canyon and Lake Powell. I also work in Vermilion Cliffs quite often and to a lesser degree up in Bryce. But mostly it's on the lake or it's in Grand Canyon. And I've been very privileged to have uh, experienced Grand Canyon in a lot of different ways, which I want to tell you about tonight. Uh, some of them have been sublime experiences, and some of them have been totally ridiculous. So I have a little bit of both of those types of experiences. Okay. Grand Canyon. Um, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here since many of you know this park already, but uh, just a couple of things that I think are important. Uh, number one, uh, Grand Canyon is a really big place, 277 miles long and averages maybe 10 miles wide and a mile deep. Probably something like 800 cubic miles of rock have been removed to form Grand Canyon. And Kind of the strange thing about this place is that it looks really big to us, but actually it's small. As an erosional event, or erosional location, it's actually small. There are lots of much bigger erosional events in the geologic history. So it appears big to us because it's not so big that we can't appreciate it. I started my photographic career in 1972. I had been interested in photography for a long time, but in 72 I was working at Kitt Peak National Observatory and took a picture of a lightning storm over the observatory. And the first time I had a photograph published, it appeared in Life magazine. And my career has been generally downhill ever since. <laughs> but I still have an affection for taking pictures of lightning storms although I kind of lost some of that enthusiasm after a couple of close calls. <coughs> um, this wasn't particularly close, but one time up on the top of Vishnu Temple, we had uh, something that was too close. Uh, this was taken near the Apapai Point on the South Rim, and you probably recognize the silhouette of O'Neill Butte. Uh, this is above South Canyon, on the rim of Marble Canyon, uh, January. From river level, this is uh, taken at uh, Granite Falls Rapid, and when you're camped there at Granite Falls, you can uh, look up through a notch in the cliff and see the North Star. Uh, by the way, the North Star 
uh, Polaris won't always be the North Star. Earth's axis has a wobble in it, and right now Earth's axis is aligned with that star pretty close, it's about a degree away. And in fact, the uh, wobble of the Earth's axis is carrying it even closer to an alignment with Polaris, but that will only be true until 2105, and then it begins to leave. Uh, in the future, uh, some kind of imaginary North Star will be up near where Vega is and Deneb. Uh, this wobble takes 26,000 years to complete. So this picture isn't always possible. Starting down the Tanner Trail in the winter, some of you probably know Mike Coltrane. This was at the end of February a few years ago, and we had a little trouble even finding the top of the trail, which is the second time that's happened to me. Coming up the Grand View in March. I've been told that this place on the trail has been modified in the past few years, but I haven't looked at it myself. People that you meet along the trail, some very interesting people. I don't know what they're all thinking. Uh, I do feel like sometimes there's a resemblance between some of them. <laughs> I've even twice seen, uh, I guess you would call them hikers, hikers uh, with uh, crutches on the Bright Angel Trail. <laughs> One time hiking into Havasu, I got a very early start. I thought I was the first one going down the trail, but there was this three-wheel vehicle out in front of me, and I couldn't imagine what it was, but it was kind of a four-wheel drive stroller. <laughs> These people were headed down to uh, Supai. My nieces uh, used to hike in Grand Canyon when they were very young, and they had Certain equipment I always had to go, teddy bear and a squirt gun. <laughs> Some of you may know John Azar. Uh, John is very particular about what he wears in Grand Canyon. That's, that's what he claims anyway. Uh, kind of the best part of my life, I think, were the years where I was uh, very fortunate to hike with George Steck. Uh, George Steck uh, retired from Sandia Laboratories in Albuquerque at age 55, and then he kind of devoted the rest of his life to doing loop hikes in Grand Canyon. And I started doing uh, these hikes with George about 1987, and we went to places that I didn't think I would ever see, or I didn't think I would ever get there on foot, or I never knew about them, or I never ever really wanted to go there, <laughs> but uh, this is one of George's routes uh, down into a 150 mile canyon, down through the Red Wall. Yeah. <clears throat> um, twice we went uh, down 150 mile canyon, and one time turned downstream and exited the canyon through Tuck Up, another time we went uh, upstream headed towards Kanab Canyon. And there's one critical section on that 150 mile of Kanab, uh, just a little bit downstream from the mouth of Mac Amoeba, where uh, the bench that we were walking on uh, all, uh, part of the time kind of pinches out and it becomes more of a cliff than a bench. And this was where we had gotten too low and we were having to make our way upwards to get to this place. It was a critical location. And the root comes across here like this. At the time, George was uh, in his 60s when we were doing these backpacking trips. And it was wonderful for me because at the time I was carrying a 4x5 camera. George, uh, at that age, was not all that fast. And I found that I could fall behind and do some photography and then catch up to these guys again. But this was quite an experience doing these kinds of uh, trips in Grand Canyon. The route into Elks Chasm, 